talks about the same story that uh, there was the prime Jedi who was the whole uh, man and then he was separated in two uh, the dark side of the force and the light side of the force. So there was a, a conflict between the Sith and the Jedi who, hold, who held different values. That's why the movies are called Star Wars because it's the war between these two factions. <laughs> and uh, <Interesting. laughs> that's okay. Uh, and uh, one of the one issue I have a small uh, disadvantage here because I didn't re see the first three movies. Okay, or I might have seen the one the one where Anakin Skywalker is a young boy, but I didn't see all three. I don't think, and so I never really saw how the the Sith were. Um, were presented in those first in episodes one through three so yes in the the prequels we we have more explanation about how the war how the world the war happened is because it your is it your opinion sophie that the producers of star wars and the writers of star wars had this broad uh, mythological yes uh, George idea. Lucas had okay but Lu was Lucas involved in the in the three yes. episodes one through three yes okay. he was a uh, actually he was involved in the six first movies he, he was the creator he may not have directed the six ones but he he was uh, involved in 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 them in the six of them Okay. And uh, he he really uh, he he was a student of uh, Joseph Campbell, right. and Joseph Campbell said he was his best student, so he was uh, very much interested in mythology. Right. Okay. That I that I do understand. Okay. So go ahead. But then the the sequel trilogy we had two uh, directors and uh, we had the. J.J. Abrams, who, dir who directed the uh, seventh movie, the, Star the Force Awakens, and the last one, The Rise of Skywalker, and Ryan Johnson, who directed the eighth movie, The Last Jedi. I'm not sure J.J. Uh, Abrams uh, studied these things. Uh, I have no information about this. Okay. However... So you, yeah, okay. However, uh, Ryan just Johnson studied Jungian psychology. Okay. Um, and so he was the director of the eighth movie. Yes. He, he, he did not study in university, but he, he did some preparation. He read some books about uh, and listened to lectures about uh, Jungian psychology. As you know, I wouldn't criticize anybody like that since that's how I am. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I probably you are. Did you ever take any courses in this in university? No, never. I studied IT in university. <laughs> you studied IT. I studied IT. <laughs> so you and I had this exchange a few weeks ago where you were very excited to see the rise of Skywalker. And then the night before I was to see it, you said you're not going to see it because you had a spoiler happen. You, you saw a spoiler and- the uh, movie, Intentionally. Uh, yeah, you, intentionally. you intentionally were not going to see it because you, you'd seen a spoiler. In no, the I, I wanted to say that I was in, intentionally uh, looking for spoilers. So it was not accidental. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> so, so you were intentionally looking for spoilers. And when you found them, you were so turned off by the result in the last movie that you said to me, you weren't going to see it. So I said, hmm, okay. So I was going to see it the next day. And I came out of the movie pretty excited because I actually liked the movie and liked the ending. And so I wonder if you would 
explain why you were upset about it, and then I can talk about why I liked it. Yes, uh, actually, there are s several reasons. So I, ha I have seen the movie later uh, yes. when I've been able to recover from uh, uh, my trauma, <laughs> <laughs> my shocked. disappointment. Yeah. And so I, I was more able to go with a analytical mind uh, <laughs> see the, the movie with my father. Um. And uh, so I can say what I liked about it, it was... It, that it was entertaining. And I think that for someone who is not attached to the characters and who just want to have fun, he may like the movie. But if you care about the myth and the character's psychology and um, the depiction of the internal uh, struggle of the characters, then you may not like the movie. <laughs> Okay, and and so what were the aspects of it that you didn't like? First, I, um, I the reason why I, I uh, wanted I wanted to know one thing about the movie before I, I uh, saw it. I wanted to know if uh, if uh, uh, Kylo Ren died would die or not. So that was the only thing I wanted to know before I I see the movie. So. The, I intentionally went on a, a Twitter and social networks because I wanted to know if, if uh, he was going to die or not. So when I learned what happened, so of course it was a, a shock, but it's not only his death, but it's how it happened and what happened next. That was so heartbreaking. And Okay, so explain what happened that was heartbreaking. Yes, first, only the fact of his death is uh, quite tragic because he was the last descendant of the Skywalker family. It means that the whole family is a story is a tragedy. So why was, go through the, the uh, ancestors because I don't, I'm not quite, connecting up why he was the last of the Skywalkers. So the, the first uh, person we know of the family is, the, um, is a Shmi Skywalker, who was an, uh, Anakin Skywalker's mother. Okay. And she, were, she had the virgin birth of Anakin Skywalker. So he, she, Anakin didn't have a father. We don't know a, <laughs> how, what, how it happened, but it's similar to what uh, how uh, Jesus was uh, conceived in the uh, Gospels. Uh. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay. And then, so Anakin. So, Ana so Anakin Skywalker was born of a virgin birth. Is that yes? Okay, <laughs> that I had missed entirely. <laughs> I'm going to have to go back and look at these things now. Go ahead. Then Anakin married uh, Padme Amid Amidala. Yes. This, the, first she was a queen, then a senator. Mm -hmm. And they, so they had uh, twins, uh, Luke and Leia. Uh, Luke uh, remained uh, single <laughs> and without child. And Leia married uh, uh, Han Solo and had uh, a child who was Ben Solo, who then became Kylo Ren. Okay, all right, uh, so I've got it. So there, and Ray, what is her ancestry, just to clarify? Well, before the rise of Skywalker, she didn't have a uh, famous uh, Oh, parents. okay, right, okay. But then when the rise of Skywalker came out, they, that was another disappointment to me. They say that the senator Palpatine, the emperor, was her grandfather. But he, it came like out of nowhere because there was no, uh, in, no signs about it in the previous two movies. Okay, and, so, uh, so the emperor was her grandfather. And who was her father then, her mother? Uh, we don't know them very much. We, we just know that they... 
they tried to save her, to protect her from the emperor by uh, uh, selling her as a slave on Jeku planet. Yes. So if you, you try to analyze the the story of the rise of Skywalker, you you will see some some things which are pretty uh, disturbing. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Oh, well, I guess so, so your parents are going to save you by selling you into slavery. Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Uh, so okay. in the previous movie, we, the, the other explanation we had is that they, sell, they sold her into slavery, but because they were drunk, drunk uh, alcoholic who needed money, so in the previous movie... I, I'm sorry, I did not understand what you said. In, in the previous movie, in the eighth movie, right. we had another uh, explanation about race uh, parents. And uh, the, they, were, they were not um, uh, related to Palpatine. But what the explanation we had was that they sold Ray into slavery because they were half alcoholic who needed money. Oh my goodness. Okay. And so the message of the previous movie was that Ray uh, had no uh, famous ancestor and she was, uh, they, they said, a nobody, but she had to become uh, whoever she decided to become. I That's see. The lesson that uh, you don't have to to, uh, to have a powerful uh, Jedi ancestor to be a powerful Jedi yourself. Okay, and do we know anything about the the Emperor at all? Where he came from? Yes, if in the pre prequels, it is uh, <laughs> we see him become the Emperor. Uh, we see that he was a senate a senator of the planet of Nabu, like uh, Padme. Uh, okay. And uh, so he was playing, uh, he was a double agent. He was a senator in the Republic and he was a Sith Lord. And okay. uh, he was the one who created the war by his, uh, his uh, Machiavellic uh, uh, schemes. <laughs> okay, so he was a Machiavellian senator yes. who, who came from the same planet as Anakin's mother, or, his, uh, or no, wife. Anakin's wife. Yes. Right. Very complicated. <laughs> okay, uh, we're gonna, we're, we can work through that uh, again, you and I. Th this is very interesting to me because most of this just flew over my head and or a lot of it did and the ancestry of the various parties got very confusing obviously because when you go to a movie you okay if you're ex going to have the hero's journey then you're then you're going to have uh, a boy and a girl and they they fight to get together stay apart and get together and but they ultimately get together and they defeat evil okay <laughs> that that's sort of the the pattern it's more complicated than that there are a number of videos on the hero's journey on youtube yes but, but it's mostly the hero's journey and Obviously, I think, and a lot of people think, that the hero's journey is too superficial, and it has misled a lot of people, because really we have the journey of our entire species. And as you in indicated from Plato's Symposium, um, there are issues that have been around for a very, very long time. And I found, I had never read that passage that I read in this conversation before. And it really relates to the entire, well, it relates to the round of life, but it also, re, it relates to the spirit going through us. And one of the 
important quotes from Dr. Jung is, we don't know where the spirit is going. And the problem with our religions is that they're constantly looking back to the Pentecost, which was a new type of consciousness developing at the beginning of Christianity, I guess 40 days after the death of Christ from then on. And we've been through an entire 2000 year cycle with that, but now we have a new day of understanding uh, of consciousness dawning. And it seems to me that's what we can now see in the Star Wars movies if we look at it in the in the big context um, which wasn't wasn't visible necessarily before so Sophie what would you have liked to have seen happen at the end okay because yeah. go ahead. Um, I needed to, to um, explain more why the fact that the Skywalker family, how it ended is so tragic is uh, when you watch the prequel, prequel trilogy, you see Anakin Skywalker fall to the dark side. And this is the, this is the, the tragedy of Star Wars. And we were, what was expected is that Kylo Ren would, Ben Solo would heal the, the, heal the, great, split. the great disease of the great tragedy of the family. And in a way he did because he gave his life to the woman he loved, which is the opposite that what Anakin did. Anakin was more possessive with his wife. He was afraid of losing her. So he uh, not directly, but in, indirectly killed her. He, because he, want, he was so afraid that he would be separated from her. So in yeah. a way, he, he did the opposite of what his grandfather did. But um, what... It's, Wait a minute, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't quite follow that. What, who was Anakin's grandfather that he did the opposite? No, Ben Solo, uh, Anakin it was uh, Ben uh, Solo's grandfather. Okay, right, all right, that's right. So it, w what's tragic is that the, now the, the family is extinct. We were hoping that there could be a, a positive ending to, to this family. Why do you think the family is extinct? Because he was the last descendant of the, fa the family. And you, you don't leave in, in the possibilities that Ray is pregnant with? Well, they didn't... Uh, <laughs> no, I don't... Yes, there, there are theories about that, but they didn't have any sexual intercourse together. They were not married there. If they had lived together for a while and then he died, okay, we, we could uh, uh, maybe okay, accept so this. Why is it called the rise of Skywalker then? Yes, that's, that's the problem. We, we don't know why they chose this title. And there are rumors that the the movie has been changed. The story of the movies has been changed a lot. Editing period. I don't know if it's true, but maybe they decided some important part of the plot at last minute. Okay, well, let me posit a different idea then. I mean, you, you wanted to see the manifestation of the healing of the split. But another idea, if we, if we take the name of the movie as The Rise of Skywalker, could it be that Ray represents the fact that an average person should be 
a Skywalker too. Uh, you don't have to be part of the royal family. Y yes, but uh, you don't have to be the part of the royal family of of good or of evil. Right? Actually, the the family is both good and evil. You yeah, can say. we all we all are good and evil. We know that. <laughs> uh, I, yes, there, there are several people who have talked about this issue uh, on the internet, and mm -hmm. I, I agree with with what they they say is that Ray had no attachment to the name Skywalker. She could have she uh, didn't like Luke Skywalker. She did not get along with him. Yeah. Uh, she. Uh, she got along with Leia, but Leia, her name was not Skywalker, it was Organa. And also she, she was in love with Ben Solo. So, Solo, so she could have chose then Organa or Solo, but she chose Skywalker, which had no emotional meaning to her. Think that uh, it's to please fans that they chose Skywalker. And it, not, it has no relevance to the story. Well, it certainly has relevance to the story because otherwise we wouldn't be talking about it here. <laughs> yeah. So it, it has relevance to the story. And, and the ultimate question is, what is the relevance of this entertainment and education of all of us in mythology and psychology? in terms of what it means to us because in the end star wars is a fiction but it's a fiction that's talking about us from a psychological perspective actually right yes i i agree with this and that's why i was upset because it had so much potential it could have been much better uh, with little effort, so that's that that's the upsetting thing about it because uh, the story that it was telling was extremely important, it, and uh, it was the the story of what you read, the story of the soulmates of uh, Aristophanes. Uh, of course, you and I know that now. Yeah, and. And so the very fact that we're having this conversation, Sophie, means that the next story can be better and will be better. And uh, writers of the next story will hear about this conversation and they'll write it differently. And uh, as a, also, uh, and one important thing that I wanted to say is we we see that the dyad represents love, which is the union of the two halves right. into a, a single uh, individual, a single man. The very strange thing is that in the movie, Palpatine, the emperor, he became stronger by, uh, by, um, a, by, by uh, hate, right? Yes, by um, he, actually, he, he might, he's the representation of hate himself. Right. And he became stronger by taking the force of love. He used the force of love to gain his strength back. Right. And it's, it's so strange as a message. But isn't that what yin and yang does? Okay, as, as yang becomes yin, yin then becomes yang. And... In antrodroma. <laughs> yeah. Yes, in antiodromia, The tendency to turn into the opposite, right? Okay, w would you allow me the... Uh, <laughs> would you allow me to explain why I liked the ending? very well or yes. like the rise of skywalker so one of the most significant and basic ideas that comes out of jungian psychology is the conjunctio as you rightly said the the issue is conjunctio 
in this. And conjunctio means the conjunction of the opposites. But the fundamental issue is that the opposites can never get together. Okay, they, they never can get together. And so the Taoists recognized that long ago when they made the yin-yang symbol and recognized that they're, it's not a still picture. It's actually a moving picture, and it's actually multi-layered, which most people don't know about. But let me just quickly show a yin-yang here, and I want to show you the layers. This is a layered yin-yang symbol, which shows that there are layers beneath layers. And so good and evil is not just one dyad. It's many dyads throughout our psyche. And uh, there's another one. And also the concept that this is a symbol that's in motion. It's either going clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on how you think about it. Let me give you another sense because I, I really want to get the overall picture here. So it's really more like this, that everything is divided up into a yin and a yang. Mm -hmm. And so there are many things that are in our psyches, th literally thousands. This only uh, represents one. And so it's in, these dyads are interacting all of the time. And so as you can see, you have the sun and the moon here, but you have black stones and white stones that are piled and that sort of thing. So that's the other idea. And then one other idea is this one, which is the one that you've been primarily talking about through this, which is the masculine and fem feminine, the yin and yang of masculine and feminine, which is also highly relevant, of course. It's a major, th major part of our being. So the conjunctio, the idea, the point is that in the conjunctio, there's never going to be a, there's never going to be mixing together so that you get a, a souffle, let's say. Okay, so you can mix, uh, I, I don't know, sugar and water and you, some, or egg, eggs and what makes a souffle? Eggs and sugar and you, you get meringue, right? <laughs> so, so you, so eggs and sugar can be mixed to make souffle. This is why alchemy came up in Jungian psychology, but when it's a souffle, it's no longer eggs or sugar, right? It's, it's something else. So it's the next thing. The next thing comes from the line that goes down through the middle. Uh, it's an imaginary line of infinite smallness that goes down through the middle of the yin and yang, right? Actually, what I saw in this movie was three conjunctios, okay? One was Obviously, the shocking conjunctio that, or the shocking dyad that Ray ultimately realizes that she's the granddaughter of, of the emperor uh, or Palatine. Uh, yes, could you please please explain how, in your opinion, this is a conjunctio? Well, because she recognizes that. She has evil within her, and she's able to integrate that. You think she integrated her Palpatine in her inheritance? Yes. That she kills him? Yeah, she kills him by reflecting him back on himself. Yes, so she eradicated her Palpatine thought. Yeah, but she, do she does that through her Palpatine part, actually. No, through the Jedi. No, she, she actually, that's my prop, another problem I have with the movie is that she didn't integrate her dark, her dark side. She, she, she integrated it by becoming Skywalker. How? Okay, at the end. 
how how becoming a skywalker allowed her to integrate her dark side i don't understand okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, fair enough. this is a discussion that deb and i were having and, and yeah. it's not it's not against you it, it's is the the movie I would have loved her to integrate her dark side, okay, and but, I was disappointed that she didn't. But but the dark <laughs> the dark side the the yang often is is power, okay, and yin is the yielding side, right? And so the fact that she holds the two swords up, the 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 two lightsabers up crossed that's a indication of the conjunctio there and she's reflecting the hate back on palpatine but she's doing it by the conjunction of the two swords right the two blue swords are they both <laughs> blue i, I don't they were, remember they were both blue, and that's my issue <laughs> okay i'm not i'm not sure of that i thought it was a red and a and no a blue one. Okay, maybe I'm wrong because obviously I've only seen the movie once and I'm going to have to see the movie many <laughs> yes. times. Okay, so this that's that's a discussion that, that can go on into eternity. So so that was one conjunctio that I saw, whether I'm right or wrong is but I mean if she had directly killed Palpatine, okay, by then the Sith would have inhabited her body and she would have become the Empress. <laughs> right. She, yeah, she would, become, she would have become hate then. That's yes. correct. Right. And so because she bounced it off, she just reflected the hate back on itself and it disappeared, right? And this is the issue always with Satan also, right? And why hate never gets you anywhere because hate creates more hate. I mean, we're seeing it right now in current events where the president has killed this Iranian general and so, and immediately hate is pushed out into the universe with, with demonstrations in Iran. And obviously that's going to, to continue to ripple down the centuries until we can stop. It's like World War I, where the Allies were so hateful of the Germans after the war because nine or 10 million men were killed on both sides and they wanted to punish the Germans that they basically created a new hateful generation that was ready to go back into World War II. But after World War II, what we did was the Marshall Plan, which rebuilt Western Europe. And so instead of punishing the Germans, who many of whom were not Nazis and, and were they were just people living who survived, you know, why punish them? The you know, a lot of the bad people were dead. And so by the Marshall Plan allowed the hate not to continue so much. And the result of that approach, both in Germany and Japan, was that Germany and Japan became among the best allies of the United States, at least in the latter half of the 20th century. And so if we allow hate to regenerate hate, then that's what you always get. On the Ben Solo side, do you think there was a point, where is the point where Ben Solo sees his good side? Well, um, actually that there is a, a compliment to this movie in a comics uh, which came out the day before I think the movie came out which mm. explains uh, which give more details on his turn to the dark side and we learn that he didn't actually kill the other students because in the previous movie we, we think he killed the other students of the academy uh, with Luke Skywalker, but 
actually he didn't. And um, so he, the only uh, people we, we see him killing in the movies are uh, the Lord Senteka, who is a, a family, uh, someone close to his family. We see him in, in the beginning of the, for the Force Awakened, the seventh movie. And, and his father, of course. So they are the, the two people he, he killed. So we, we can see that he has been very much manipulated uh, since uh, even before his birth. And, and also we, we know this from uh, novels, uh, Star Wars novels, which explains that uh, there was a dark presence that her mother, his mother was feeling as uh, she was pregnant and who were, the dark presence was already trying to, to steal her son. And uh, we, we uh, hear in the beginning of the Rise of Skywalker that he heard, he, heard, he heard voices in his head all the time and there were uh, Palpatine's voice. Mm -hmm. So he heard different voices, his grandfather, Darth Vader, and Snoke, who is the main uh, villain in the seventh and eighth movies. And actually they were all Palpatine, tra yeah. trying to manipulate him. I see, yes. I think that at the end he does have a connectio with his dark side and between his dark side and his light side, right? And that's evidenced by the fact that in the end he gives his life for Ray and for his life force. But uh, um, that's, that's not really how I understand it. I, I think what happened is that he, uh, it's not a conjuncture, it's that he, he became who he was before, actually. He, uh, the Kylo Ren is dead. Ray, actually, we see that Ray, she stabbed him with his own saber. Uh -huh. And so she killed Kylo Ren, who, which was his persona, his evil persona. And right, Kylo okay. Ren is dead. And then he become who is, he, um, he become um, Ben Solo again. Okay. I mean, that, that's a fair enough analysis. I could, I'd never took it that far. And, and so you're, you're way ahead of me on these, on a lot of this stuff, but which is very interesting. And I'm sure this interview is going to be very interesting to people, but I thought the ending was quite beautiful in the sense that first of all, Ray gives her life for Ben Solo. Okay. Right. Uh, it's the other yeah. way around. No, no, she's killed. Yes, but she didn't do this for Ben Solo. She, she, she's killed bef because she tries to, to uh, kill Palpatine. <laughs> right, she killed Palpatine, but... And she died by, because of this, because, the, because of her fight with Palpatine. But I think, wasn't she trying to protect Ben? No, or, no. no? He came to help her, and he's the one who died for her. Okay, but she died first. Yes, she right? died by fighting Palpatine. Okay, sorry, I only saw the movie. I saw the movie once, and you must have a better memory about it than I do. Where was Kylo Ren or Ben Solo at the time that she was fighting Palpatine? In a pit. <laughs> He actually, what happened is that first she she came to Palpatine and she, he she he um, invited her to kill him so the Sith would inhabit her body her body and she would become the Empress. Right. But Ray refuses, and he says, "You have no family." And we and one important character trait of Ray is that he. She wanted to have a family, and she felt alone. So it's her main, her main wound is that she felt alone. 
And then when, when he says this, you, you have a, a Ben Solo who, who, who arrives. And they have this forced connection by the, uh, through their minds. And he, he already uh, had uh, turned to the light side, so he, he was already uh, Ben Solo again. So they have this uh, mind connection, this force bond, as they are called. So she's relieved because she's not alone anymore. And uh, she's uh, sending him uh, his mother's saber, which is blue. And so she, he, she's able to send the saber through their force connection. And he has the saber and he, he's able to kill uh, his uh, previous knights uh, because they are now against him as, as he has turned to the light side. So he fight against them. And then he, he come to where is Ray. So they are together now in front of Palpatine. And uh, Palpatine realize, realizes that they are dyad. And as a consequence, he takes the strength of their dyad to uh, gain his force, his strength again. Uh-huh. And uh, now he does not want to uh, Ray to to be the empress. He he wants to to kill them now. He he doesn't need them anymore. Right. And first he he uh, used his uh, for this his um, lightnings against Ben Solo, and he falls into a pit. Okay. So Ray Ray is now all alone against him, and then. The, she's able to connect with the Jedi who are dead and the Jedi help her to, to defeat Palpatine. Okay, so then she has the two Jedi swords. The two blue Jedi soul, uh, right. swords of the brother and sister Luke and Leia. Right, okay. The twin, twin brother and sister. Right, okay, so I've, I've got that. And, but, so then what I... The the conjunctio that I thought was quite beautiful is that she at some point makes a sacrifice for Ben Solo. Okay. No, she doesn't. She didn't. She doesn't. Okay. That was only my perception then. Okay, <laughs> and, and but she overcomes hate by reflecting the hate of Palpatine back on himself. Well, she become she becomes like a vessel or, uh, of the Jedi. So the Jedi in, inhabit her body and they they killed uh, Palpatine by reflecting his hate against him. Okay. And they and then uh, Rey is killed in the process. All right, so Ray is killed, and then Ben Solo brings her back to life, giving yes. up his life force for her. Yes. Okay, which in the end, and, and so that's a, that's a conjunctio there. Okay, yeah, where, perhaps. A, yeah. a sacrifice and a conjunctio, certainly. And so I thought the ending was quite appropriate because in any war, it's always the women who have to reestablish civilization, right? You can't, you can't have only men survive or you don't have a species anymore, right? So in the end, the feminine has to survive. Yes, but there is another problem with the character of Rey, is uh, her evolution. And uh, we, the, we can see sim- symbolically that she became a, a little girl again in the rise of skywalker well, became well, a, a what again um well actually in the in the the force awakens the seventh movie she's uh, depicted as a child uh-huh. and in the eighth movie uh, symbolically we can see that she hit poverty so she becomes a woman. Okay. There, there are very, a lot of symbols of uh, wom- women sexuality in the second, in the eighth movie. Okay. 
and and she even her hair changed she, um, she uh, her hair went down mm -hmm. and that was a, a symbol of her becoming a woman okay and the 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 island of act two uh, was all the whole island was a symbol of femininity and women's sexuality and life and uh, all of this but in the rise of skywalker she she be, she returned to her previous uh, state of the the girl of the child of the desert and mm -hmm. she has a, her previous haircut uh, her her yeah. do with the right. three bones and right. in the end she's in the desert so the desert is a symbol of aridity and she's a uh, alone a like of, in, i'm sorry it's a symbol of aridity yes yeah it's it's an arab it, it's an arid state within the psyche yes yes okay and and, the, and that of course refers back to the, the red book and and dr jung's whole piece about the desert and being lost yes. in the desert okay go ahead and and she she's back in like she was in the seventh movie because she can come from the desert and uh, she she she's the the girl in the desert who's been abandoned and who feels alone right so now she has to find a new soulmate <laughs> yes but it's not so simple <laughs> no it's not so simple in the desert uh that's that's true but then, then you have to put um, and you, you and, have uh, to water the desert. In the end, we have the feminine principle, who's lost her man. So she she's again uh, a half, no soulmate, alive anyway, and she's therefore lost in the desert, which is a psychological state, right? And it refers back to. The red book and and the desert portion of the red book but that's the round of life right i mean the round of life is that if you're going to have these constant wars uh it's always the feminine that puts civilization back together again in the end okay because so what, for example, so many men were killed in Germany and France during World War I, and what happened was that the women then delivered a new generation of men who then fought again in World War II. <laughs> you know, so the women put the civilization back again, but the first time it was with all the hatred with the Treaty of Versailles, which was very punishing on the German people and terribly pu punishing on the German people, most of whom hadn't been responsible for the wars anyway, because there were tens of millions of Germans, but not all of them fought. And the same with the French, but the Allies at the end of World War I thought it would be a good idea to punish the German nation. And so that's what happened with the Treaty of Versailles. It was very punitive. But in the end of World War II, it was realized that that had really created World War II. And so they took another approach at the end of World War II. At least that's my observation about it. But I was satisfied at the end that Ray, as the feminine principle, was the survivor. And walking off into the sunset toward a new life, let's say, or sunrise. I don't know whether it was a sunrise or a sunset. But there were two suns. <laughs> oh, there the were two suns. The binary sense, which is a... A very famous uh, sim symbol in Star Wars, uh, yeah. and it represents the twins, brother and sister, Luke and Leia. Uh, okay. <laughs> and that's why we see their ghosts 
in the end of the movie. We see Luke the and ghosts of Luke and of Leia. Luke and Leia. I see. Okay. So it's really a story about the species, about the whole human species. And, you know, as I indicated when I showed the yin-yang symbols, the, we are very much more complicated than what is pre what could possibly be presented in a movie in, uh, in Star Wars. But I think it seems to me that the overall, the producers over the 40 year period have done a pretty good job of, of providing kind of an education uh, for the species. And, that, and it's through movies and, and various other forms that we learn today. I mean, we don't learn in school anymore, really. <laughs> it's very hard to learn in school these days, and, and lots of things we should learn in school aren't anymore. They're learned in other ways. From my perspective, uh, it, as a, you know, I always think of the imagery that comes up in the psyche, in my psyche, and as I've said many times, as you know, that when something is happening to me, I'll have a, a scene from a movie, including the dialogue, pop up in my head. And that's my psyche telling me, this is that kind of situation. Pay attention to it. It's all the genres of movies, not only Star Wars, but all movies. And I've probably seen 3,000 movies or maybe 4,000 in my lifetime. But, and today we're all looking at television programs and movies almost all the time. And so that's how it works. While, we're, while we can be disappointed, and you, you rightfully can be di disappointed that the ending that you had hoped would happen didn't happen, you know, that's, uh, but that's at a, that's at a physical manifestation level, which can be fixed. Okay, because then, because you and I have had this conversation and some future writer or you goes and writes a new story, write the new story that more perfectly portrays uh, the whole concept. Because I, I don't have the sense that George Lucas at the beginning of this really got all the complexity of it. Well, yes. Um, one thing I wanted to say, and you, you will see this when you you have time to, to read my emails, is that mm -hmm. there was something that George Lucas was hit, hinting at uh, in the Fractal trilogy, trilogy. And it was the problem of this, the integration of the shadow and uh, and uh, the whole problem of uh, which is described by Eric Newman in his book uh, that psychology and a new ethic right. uh, and uh, the the problem of the the Jedi philosophy uh, is that the it it was the this philosophy that led uh, Anakin to the dark side. And uh, I, when I had hope that the new trilogy uh, would answer this problem and become a representation of the new, the new ethic, as Eric Newman uh, described it, describes what, it. What did you feel that Neumann's solution was? Neumann. Uh, right. Yes, but but his solution was uh, uh, actually about um, integr making integrating the shadow, making it making it conscious, and um, so and uh, becoming a, a whole individual instead right. of split individual. 
Right. And of course, that's the Jungian solution generally, which is that uh, what solves the problem is consciousness. Edinger, when he was talking about individuation in his talk that can be found on YouTube, he's talking about the new uh, individuation, the new myth, uh, or something like the new myth. He, he talks about individuation and the need to go through these steps. He's asked, how do you do that? And he says, well, you have to reflect on what you love and what you hate. And that's the question that he's asked and his answer. And one of the things that is a piece of advice that I think we ought to pass along is that you shouldn't try to start the individuation process too young. Okay, I, I mean, I read that again in the last couple of days in some of my reading that the first job is to, or I know it was, I, I looked again at an editor video that was from about 1994, which I, I think was given the name The Future of Christianity or something like that. And in that video, Edinger emphasizes that the first task is to develop a strong ego and a character that, su that supports society in general. And once you have that developed, and it has to develop anew in each human being, then it's possible, then you begin on the individuation quest. I don't think that's the hero's journey. The hero's journey is, is the development of the ego, it seems to me. And that, you know, and the, the movie four, which ends with Luke Skywalker getting praised in this throng of other fighters for the, for the cause, that's very much an ego thing, right? But then you have to, then once you get beyond that, okay, so you're a hero when you're a great athlete or when you're a brilliant student or you become a Rhodes mm -hmm. Scholar or whatever that is, okay, that's, that's the end of the hero's journey. But what are you going to do tomorrow? You know, what, when you wake up and somebody's already given you in the U.S. it would be a Congressional Medal of Honor or something like that, or a Bronze Star or a Silver Star. So now you're officially named a hero, but, you know, what are you going to do tomorrow? Okay, What are you going to do for the species and for your family and for yourself tomorrow? And so that's the individuation process. And that really begins at that point. In Star Wars, we, we've seen individuation come along. Uh, obviously, Ben Solo and Ray are both individuated at the end, pretty much, I would think. But uh, I don't really <laughs> share you don't, this. You don't opinion. think so? Okay, yeah. what, what are the shortcomings of that observation? Well, especially uh, Ray, uh, she didn't. Uh, integrate some parts of herself. In what way? Give me an example. Can you explain that? Well, she didn't integrate her dark side and she didn't think she didn't uh, um, become a woman. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So she she basically became a strong tomboy is what you're saying. Yes. Okay, so her, her a woman... A strong, uh, or maybe not tomboy, but she becomes a little girl, rather. She becomes a what? <laughs> a little girl again. A little girl again, okay. Aha. Uh -huh. All right, well, uh, that's an interesting observation because I... It's one, I, it's one that I think a woman needs to make, so I'm glad that you 
you made it because it, you know, it shows how significant some of these subliminal messages are that come out in movies that, you know, they're, they're trying to make Ray back into a, a traditional little girl and uh, I don't think they woman. intentionally, I don't know how intentional it was, but that's the, the mess, the symbolic message we get of her being in her white clothes, clothes and her, pre the same hair, her do she had as a little girl uh -huh. and back in, in the desert and uh, alone again and happy. She has this uh, smile on her face of innocence 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 but no man in her life by, yes. by implication and also this is the same kind of smile that she, she has in the beginning in the first movie of the trilogy when um, uh, the the robot BB-8 uh, asks her about her life story and she she says that it's it's a secret she doesn't want to tell about it and she smiles and people have said that it was a it's like depressive smile and if you see the movie uh, joker um it's uh, you see the the main character out of fleck he he tries to smile all the time uh -huh. and so her his mother thinks she's he's happy because he's smiling ah yes and uh, so ray uh, we can interpret it, her smile this way that she's repressing her darkness her sadness Right, which is true of a lot of women. I mean, men and women. Men both. and women too. I mean, there's obviously lots of depression going around, and this is why we're killing seventy thousand people a year in the United States with drugs, because people are not, because people are depressed. Well, I think this has been quite a rough, <laughs> <laughs> very interesting discussion. It seems to me that that you and I could develop these themes in a much more complete way for others. I, I think that this this is a start, but there's a lot more complexity here, obviously, than I have seen because you know some of the things you said to me today, I, you know, I just didn't see at all. You you went there for entertainment I so. went there for entertainment and I didn't know I was going to get a, a <laughs> global history lesson on philosophy <laughs> yes but I don't think it was really made this way uh, it's it's something that you have to consciously look for right I agree with that and maybe that's the new consciousness that we're starting to move into. I mean, Jung and Edinger and Neumann and all those folks all said that we're developing into a new level of consciousness. And so that new level of consciousness is the type of thing that we have been talking about during this period. And you know, it's a, it's a consciousness, you know, I never intentionally went to any movie to be educated. Okay. <laughs> I went, I've always gone to movies to be entertained, I think. And it's only in the fullness of time that I realize that this is the way myself communicates with me. Myself takes and this is basically what Jung said, your self takes the images that it has available to it, and those are partially hereditary, but they're partially 
uh, gained during a lifetime and communicates to you with through those images with dreams, visions, and feelings, and that sort of thing. And so it's subtle, and we need to understand the subtlety of it. And so for me, I've experienced it now so that I know that if something comes to mind, boy, I better pay attention to this situation because uh, myself, that's a communication from myself as opposed to my ego. And, but it's important, what I was saying earlier was that it's important to have a developed ego so that you can differentiate between what's good, good for you and good for the future and what's bad for you and bad for the future. And, yes, uh, it's not something easy. It's no, it's, no, it's not easy. So I think that this kind of analysis this that we've been having today, this discussion about what this movie is or this set of movies is and should be and should have been maybe can can get done better in the future, not in, not necessarily in a in a further elaboration on this particular storyline, but in a new way, some new filmmaker and writer can see the importance and the significance of these sorts of ideas and then elaborate it better in the future. It'd be interesting to see how that develops in the next decade or so. Certainly in the first 10 years of after I saw Star Wars, I was only happy with it because it was entertaining. <laughs> Maybe and you should, you should. It's, it's important. Well, it's important to be entertaining, yes. So the hero's journey is fine. We, you know, we had the hero's journey of Top Gun, for example. Okay, so Top Gun had a very similar set of events and the end maverick is the hero of the day but then what you know that that's the question you know once you've been through the hero's journey once or 20 times what follows that how do you become a better person how do you integrate that into your personal wisdom that's the issue and of course there i think there is a new top gun movie where Maverick is playing the older officer this time. I haven't seen it yet. I don't, maybe it hasn't come out yet, but it's it's going to come out in in the early part of next of this year, I think, maybe January, February. But again, that's another that was a hero's journey, uh, Top Gun, and it was very entertaining at the time, superbly done, and and uh, complete with an anima figure and so on. But, you know, then what? That's the question. I mean, what, so what happens to Maverick when he's a wise old man? That's a good question. See how they treated that one. <laughs> <laughs> His wisdom was limited. At Actually, the end. I, I think I've, I've, I've read somewhere, and I agree with this, that Luke's, Luke Skywalker's hero's journey actually ended in The Last Jedi, in the eighth movie. And the, yes. the eighth movie was very subversive because people didn't like the fact that uh, uh, the, the darkness that Luke displays in The Last Jedi, they, they didn't like it. it. They said that it was not like who he was in the, the original trilogy. But right. And I mean, I, when I went back and look at, looked at that, and I did that only a week ago, um, because I was trying to prepare for our discussion, we have a heck of a lot of his story that's missing between in his individuation. Okay, the hero's journey maybe is fine for developing the ego, but then we don't know anything about 
his individuation from the time he disappeared at the end of uh, movie six or whatever it was. You know, I, to me, it was a, it's a cop out of, of Luke. And so why do we think he could come in and, and do those things in movie number eight, you know? Yes. Uh Actually, I remember it was in one of the YouTube channels I mentioned. Uh, its name is What the Force? Uh, like, what the hell? But yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. What okay. the Force? Yeah, right. What the Force? And in one of their last podcasts, they explain why, in her opinion, there was a mythological uh, an issue with the myth in The Rise of Skywalker, and they were talking about the hero's journey, mm -hmm. and they were saying that the last steps of the hero's journey were actually happened in The Last Jedi for Luke. Because the, the, the hero's journey is supposed to bring the, uh, I think Joseph Campbell called it the boom to the people. Mm -hmm. So he's supposed to to bring some the fruit of his adventure to everybody, okay. and this happens in the end of the eighth eighth movie because when he he dies, there is a he inspires people. People see see him as a hero, and they we see a little boy who wants to become a Jedi like Luke Skywalker in the end of the eighth movie. So what we see is he brought some democracy uh, in, related to, in relation to the Force. And uh, so any little boy could hope to become a, uh, like Luke Skywalker. Yeah, but any little boy would have hoped to become like Luke Skywalker at the end of number four also. Mm, yes, but we don't see it. Whereas in the eighth movie, it's, it's explicit that he inspires uh, little boys in the galaxy. It, it, yeah, but that not that then a continuation of just uh, no, basically we, a continuation? No, because we, we don't see it before. In the original trilogy, we see we we don't see him inspiring uh, other people. Okay, it seems to me that the problem there is that he's basically in he's inspiring young men, young little boys to become heroic in the Star Wars in the wars of good and evil, rather than. Uh, inspiring them to be wis to be wise. Actually, no, because in the eighth movie we see his character becomes more, much more subtle. Uh, we see in the beginning of the movie he teaches Ray that the 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 he teaches her the um, faults, the limitations of the Jedi. And he and there, I uh, watched a video uh, which I sent to you on the internet. How uh, actually in the in the Last Jedi, uh, Luke is a Taoist, uh, a Taoist Taoist uh, teacher. And yeah, I I understand I understand that he's a teacher at the end. Yes, uh, but he learned he learned to. Uh, to see um, the problems of the, the Jedi philosophy and he learned from his failures. So he, he integrated his dark side in the eighth movie. And well, I think he okay. gained true wisdom in, in the end. He well, I, I think he did too, but I, I, I just think it's a hell of a leap from him disappearing to him being this wisdom master at the end. I mean, he, he obviously is a wisdom man, master at the end and okay. Taught Ray a few things, but 
what we're missing is that whole <laughs> intro. Oh, you, you need to, to, to watch again the scenes where he's teaching Ray because it's very profound, I think. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. So these, <laughs> these are the scenes where he's teaching Ray on the island. Yes, and it's very important because he doesn't teach her how to fight. Huh. He's teaching her something much more philosophical. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, there's, I mean, I wonder if there's an aspect of Bushido there. Do you know what Bushido no. is? Bushido is, uh, is the warrior code that was followed by samurai in Japan over the last 2,000 years. Um, and, you know, I, that code is is also very profound. <laughs> but anyway, ob obviously in whatever 18 hours of movie, you can't really cover <laughs> the, the completeness of, of uh, mythology for the last 3,000 years. So overall, I have to say that it's an impressive series. I did, I did find myself getting a bit bored with the model because the model ended up being a lot of sword fights, a lot of sameness to them. Uh, for example, in all the movies, there's the bar scene, uh, even if brief <laughs> with the, with the various uh, aliens, which I thought I've always thought was a good scene, but you know, they became somewhat formulaic. And so, to the extent that they became formulaic, I think they lost the meaning. Which movies are, are you talking about? Um, all, the, uh, the, all the Star Wars movies. All the Star Wars movies have lots of sword fights, and they have lots of... Uh, and they all have the bar scene. Okay, for an example is oh, the bar okay. scene. Okay, yeah, so they all... it's not my favorite scene in, in the movies. <laughs> it's not your favorite scene. Yeah. Okay, well, it was my favorite scene in, in Star Wars 4. Okay, in Episode 4, it was my favorite scene. Okay. But, <laughs> from an entertainment point of view, and also for, uh, philosophic, for philosophical and, and social reasons, I thought it was a terrific scene. My point is just the fact that every movie had to have that scene somehow, even though in the last movie it was very short. Here I'm quibbling, I guess, but somehow you have to keep the series interesting. And, um, you know, as I said, I, I guess I've seen one of the first three. Uh, I've seen episode one maybe, but not episodes two and three. And it was the reason I didn't was because by that time, which that was the fourth movie that was made, uh, it had be become rather formulaic. And so I wasn't so excited to go see the formula again, per se. Yes, if you want a good uh, sword fight, meaningful sword fight, you may find one in uh, the third, mo third movie, uh, Revenge of the Sith. Okay. There is one which I, I don't like ex uh, very much action scenes, but this one is very emotional as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that, so I, I, now I'm going to have to go back and relook it. So here, here's what I'm proposing. And I, I'll, I'll send you this, but I, I wrote it out on an adapt kit today. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... I thought because of your depth of knowledge about the philosophy of these things that you and I could do a series of interviews where we expand on this a bit more. And um, what I wrote on the napkin here are the questions for a reporter, which are who, what, when, where, why, and how. I just wrote a few things, but I, I thought that we could do kind of an overview of the whole series 
uh, number one, try to do a video that's really an overview, intentionally an overview of the series, movies one through nine. And meanwhile, I'll try to get time to look at the other two movies and so on. But, but you, can, you can provide the detail. I think it can be a contribution to help people think about how to look at movies going forward because it's a contribution to consciousness, literally. It's, it's, the, it's the transformation of human consciousness that we're talking about, and this is how it's done these days. Okay, it took a hell of a long time for it to start to happen uh, in the last round. Okay, it started with Christ, and you know, Christ went through his, his uh, cycle and then the church went through its cycle and now we have a new cycle being born. And if people understand what that new cycle is, they'll be more prepared for it, it seems to me, kind of, excuse me, consciously. And I think that we could explain that with... Uh, with a bit more, uh, with reference to the Star Wars movies again. And honestly, I think that what we've said in this two hour period has been, is very useful to people. And I think that uh, we can do some more. I'd like to make it a series if you're, if you're willing, if you're interested. Thank you very much. Uh, I had a very great time uh, talking <laughs> to you. <laughs>